Hi, I'm Philip Hickman of Actors Theatre of Columbus, and you are watching the Shakespeare Underground. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. So as you know, Actors Theatre is supported by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, and the Columbus Foundation. We're really grateful to them uh, for making it possible for us to continue doing staged readings for you, even in a slightly different format than we've been doing them the last couple of years. So tonight, uh, we're presenting a piece that's about 100 years old uh, called Augustus Does His Bit by George Bernard Shaw. It's a delightful little comedy that features a lot of government incompetence and nepotism and the trials and travails of a nation in crisis. So it's good to take a look at what it's like in circumstances different than our own. So without further ado, I'd like to present McLean Nagy as Augustus, Duncan McKinney as the clerk, and Beth Josephson as the lady in Augustus Does His Bit. And if you'd like to see what other shows we have coming up, you can always look at www.theactorstheater.org. All right, thanks guys, and on with the show. The Mayor's Parlor in the Town Hall of Little Pilfington. Lord Augustus Highcastle, a distinguished member of the governing class in the uniform of a colonel and very well preserved at 45, is comfortably seated at a writing table with his heels on it, reading the Morning Post. The door faces him a little to his left at the other side of the room. The window is behind him, in the fireplace, a gas stove. On the table, a bell button and telephone. Portraits of the past mayors in robes and gold chains adorn the walls. A clerk with a short white beard and whiskers and a very red nose shuffles in. Hello? Who are you? The staff. You the staff? What do you mean, man? What I say, there isn't anybody else. Where are the others? At the front. Quite right. Most proper. Why aren't you at the front? Over age. 57. And you can still do your bit? Many an older man is in the GRs or volunteering from home. I have volunteered. Then why are you not in uniform? They said they wouldn't have me if I was given away with a pound of tea. Told me to go home and not be an old silly. Young Bill Knight that I took with me got two and seven pence. I got nothing. Is this justice? This country is going to the dogs, if you ask me. No, I do not ask you, sir. And I will not allow you to say such things in my presence. Our states are one of the greatest men in history. Our generals are invincible. Our army is the admiration of the world. How dare you tell me this country is going to the dogs? Why did they give young Bill Knight two and seven pence and not give me even my tram fare? Do you call that being great statesmen? As good as robbing me, I call it. <laughs> That's enough. Leave the room. Send my secretary. I'm the secretary. I can't leave the room and send myself to you at the same time, can I? Then don't be insolent. Where is the gentleman I have been corresponding with, Mr. Horatio Floyd Beamish? Here, me. You, you. Ridiculous! What right have you to call yourself by a pretentious thing of that sort? You may drop the Horatio Floyd. Beamish is good enough for me. Is there nobody else to take my instruction? It's me or nobody. And for two pins, I'd chuck it. Don't you drive me too far. Old ones like me are up in the world now. If we were not at war, I should discharge you on the spot for disrespectful behavior. But. England is in danger, and I cannot think of my personal dignity at such a moment. Don't you think of yours either, worm that you are, or I shall have you arrested under the Defense of the Realm Act. Double quick. What do I care about the realm? They've done me out two and seven. No, oh, damn your two and seven. Did you receive my letters? Yes. I had first a meeting here last night, went straight to the platform from the train. I wrote to you that I should expect you to be present and report yourself. Why did you not do so? The police wouldn't let me on the platform. Did you tell them who you were? 
They knew who I was. That's why they wouldn't let me up. Jesus, this is too silly for anything. That this town wants waking up. I made the best recruiting speech I ever made in my life. Not man joined. What did you expect? You told them our gallant fellows are falling at the rate of thousand a day in a big push. Dying for little Pliffington, you say. Come and take their places, you say. This isn't a way to recruit. But I expressly told them their widows would have pensions. I heard you. Would have been all right if it had been the widows you wanted to get round. I, this, this town is inhabited by dastards. I say it with the full sense of responsibility. Dastards! They call themselves Englishmen, and they are afraid to fight. Afraid to fight? You should see them on Saturday night. Yes, they fight one another, but they won't fight the Germans. They got grudges against one another. How can, you, how can they have grudges against the Huns that they never saw? They've no imagination. That's what it is. Bring the Huns here, and they'll quarrel with them fast enough. <laughs> they'll have them here if they're not careful. <laughs> Have you carried out my orders about the war saving? Yes. The allowance of petrol has been reduced by three quarters? It has. And you have told the motor car people to come here and arrange to start munition work now, and their motor businesses is stopped. It hasn't stopped. They're busier than ever. <laughs> what? Making small cars. No cars? The old cars only do 12 miles to the gallon. Everybody has to have a car that will do 35 now. I mean, can't they take the train? There aren't any trains now. They tore up the rails and sent them to the front. <laughs> well, we have to get about somehow. This is perfectly monstrous. Not in the least what I intended. Hell. Sir. Hell, they say, is paved with good intentions. <laughs> insinuate that hell is paved with my good intentions, with the good intentions of his majesty's government? I don't mean to insinuate anything until the defense of the realm act is repealed. It isn't safe. They told me that this town had set to set an example to all of England in the matter of economy. I came down here to promise the mayor a knighthood for his exertions. The mayor? Where do I come in? You don't come in. You go out. This is the fool. This is the fool of a place. I am greatly disappointed. Deeply disappointed. What more can we do? We've shut up everything. The picture gallery is shut. The museum is shut. The theaters and picture show is shut. I haven't seen a movie picture in for six months. Man, man, what, what? Do you want to see a picture show when the hun is at the gate? <laughs> I don't know, though. It drove me melancholy mad at first. I was on the point of taking a pinna for rat poison. Why didn't you? Because a friend advised me to take a drink instead. They saved my life, though it makes me very poor company in the mornings, as <clears throat> perhaps you have noticed. Well, my soul, you are not ashamed to stand there and confess yourself a disgusting drunkard. Well, what of it? We're at war now, and everything's changed. Besides, I should lose my job here if I stood drinking at the bar. I'm a respectable man and must buy my drink and take it home with me. And they won't serve me with less than a quart. If you told me before that the war I could get through a quart of whiskey a day, I shouldn't have believed you. That's the good of war. It brings out powers in a man that have never he himself expected. You could say so yourself in your speech last night. I did not know I was talking to an imbecile. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. There must be an end to this drunken slacking. I'm going to establish a new order of things here. I shall come down every morning before breakfast until things are properly in train. Have a cup of coffee and two rolls for me here every morning at half past ten. Hmm? You can't have no rolls. The only baker that baked the rolls was a hun and he's been interned. Quite right, too. Uh, and there was no Englishman to take his place. There was, but he was caught spying, and then they took him up to London and shot him. Shot an Englishman? Well, it stands to reason. If the Germans wanted to spy, they wouldn't employ a German that everyone would expect, doesn't it? 
Do you mean to say, you, you scoundrel, that an Englishman is capable of selling his country to the enemy for gold? Not as a general thing, I wouldn't say it. But there's men here who would sell their own mothers for two coppers if they got the chance. Beamish, it's an ill bird that fouls its own nest. It wasn't me that let little Pippington get foul. I don't belong to the governing class. I only tell you what you can't have any roles. Can, can, can you tell me where I can find an intelligent being to take my orders? One of the street swiver, sweepers used to teach in the school until it was shut up for the sake of the economy. Will he do? What? You mean to tell me that when the lives of our gallant fellows in our trenches and the fate of the British Empire depend on our keeping up the supply of shells, you are wasting money on sweeping the streets? We have to. We dropped it for a while, but the infant death rate went up. Something frightful. What matters the death rate of little Pifflington in a moment like this? Think of our gallant soldiers, not our squalling infants. If you want soldiers, you must have children. You can't buy them in boxes like toy soldiers. The mission, the long shot of it is, you are no patriot. Go downstairs to your office and have that gas stove taken away and replaced by an ordinary grate. The Board of Trade has urged me on the necessity for economizing gas. Our orders from the Minister of Munitions is to use gas instead of coal, because it saves material. Which is it to be? Both! Don't criticize your orders, obey them. Yours is not to reason why, yours but to do and die. That's war. <clears throat> Have you anything else to say? Yes, I want to rise. I have noticed something about it in the papers. Heard you mention it once or twice. Now that I come to think of it. Our gallant fellow who's dying in the trenches and you want to rise. What are they dying for? To keep me alive, isn't it? Well, what's good of that if I'm dead or of hunger by the time they come back? Everybody else is making sacrifices without the thought of self and you. Not half. They aren't. Where's the baker's sacrifice? Where's the coal merchants? Where's the butchers? Charging me double. That's how they sacrifice themselves. Well, I want to sacrifice myself that way too. Just double next Saturday. Double and not a penny less. Or no secretary for you. Go! Liberal pro German. Who are you calling a pro-German? Another word, and I'll charge you under the act with discouraging me. Go! The clerk blenches and goes out. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Ring, oh. ring. Yes, who are you? Oh! Lulu, is it? <laughs> yes, there's nobody in the room. Fire away. What? A spy? A woman. <laughs> oh, yes, I brought it down with me. Do you suppose I'm such a fool as to let it out of my hands? Why, it gives a list of all our anti-aircraft emplacements from Ramsgate to Skness. The Germans would give a million for it. What? How could she possibly know about it? I haven't mentioned it to a soul. Except, of course, dear Lucy. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, Toto and Lady Popham and that lot. They don't they're all right. I mean, that I haven't mentioned it to any Germans. Mm. Pooh, don't you be nervous, old chap. I know you think me a fool, but I'm not such a fool as that. If she tries to get it out of me, I'll have her in the towel before you ring up again. <laughs> Shh! Bring in. Bring off. Oh, my! The clerk returns. Are you engaged? What business is that of yours? However, if you will take trouble to read the society papers of this week, you will see that I am engaged to the horrible Lucy Popham, youngest daughter of... That isn't what I mean. Can you see a female? 
course I can see a female as easily as a male. Do you suppose I'm blind? You don't seem to follow me. Somehow, there's a female downstairs, what you might call a lady. She wants to know if you can see her, if I let her up. You mean, am I disengaged? Tell the lady I have just received news of great importance, which will occupy my entire attention for the rest of the day, and that she must write for an appointment. I'll ask her to explain her business to me. I'm not above talking to a handsome young female when I get the chance. Stop! Does she seem to be a person of consequence? A regular marchioness, if you ask me. Mm. Beautiful, you say? A human chrysanthemum, sir. Believe me. It was extremely inconvenient for me to see her. But the country is in danger, and we must not consider our own comfort. Think how our gallant fellows are suffering in the trenches. Show her up. Stop whistling instantly, sir. This is a not casino. Isn't it? You just wait till you see her. He goes out. The clerk returns, devotedly ushering a very attractive lady, brilliantly dressed. She has a dainty wallet hanging from her wrist. Augustus hastily covers up his toilette apparatus with the morning post and rises in an attitude of pompous condescension. Here she is. May I offer you a chair, lady? Be seated, madame. Are you Lord Augustus Highcastle? Madam, I am. The great Lord Augustus? I should not dream of describing myself so, madam, but uh, no doubt I have impressed my countrymen, and may I say my... A countrywoman, <laughs> as having some exceptional claims to their a consideration. <laughs> what a beautiful voice you have. Well, what you hear, madam, is the voice of my country, which now takes a sweet and noble tone, even in the harsh mouth of high officials. Please, go on. You express yourself so Wonderfully. It would be strange indeed if after sitting on 37 royal commissions, mostly as chairman, I had not mastered the art of public expression. Even the radical papers had paid me high compliment of declaring that I am never more impressive than when I have nothing to say. I never read the radical papers. All I can tell you is that what we women admire in you is not the politician, but the man of action, the heroic warrior, the beau savoir. Madam, I beg, please, that my military exploits are not a pleasant subject, unhappily. Oh, I know, I know. Oh, shamefully, you have been treated. What ingratitude. But the country is with you. We women are with you. No, oh, do you think all our hearts do not throb and that our nerves thrill when we heard how when you were ordered to occupy that terrible quarry in Hollock and you stepped into it at the head of your men like a sea god riding on a tidal wave you suddenly sprang over the top shouting to Berlin forward dashed at the German army single-handed and and made prisoner by the Huns yes and what was my reward? They said I had disobeyed orders and sent me home. Had they forgotten Nelson in the Baltic? Has any British battle ever been won except by a bold initiative? I say nothing of professional jealousy. It exists in the army as elsewhere, but it is a bitter thought to me that the recognition denied me by my country, or rather by the radical cabal in the cabinet which pursues my family with rancorous hatred, that this recognition, I say, came to me at the hands of an enemy, of a rank passion. You don't say so. Who else should I be here instead of starving to death in a room 
Yes, madam, the colonel of the Pomeranian Regiment, which captured me after learning what I had done and conversing for an hour with me on European politics and military strategy, declared that nothing would induce him to deprive my country of my services and set me free. I offered, of course, to procure the release and exchange of a German officer of equal quality, but he would not hear of it. He was kind enough to say that he would not believe that any German officer answering to that description existed. I had my first taste of ingratitude of my own country when I made my way back to our lines. A shot from our front trench struck me in the head. I still carry that flattened projectile as a trophy. Had it penetrated my brain, I might never have sat on the Royal Commission. I fortunately, we have strong heads, we are high castles. Nothing has ever penetrated our brains. <laughs> how thrilling. How simple. How tragic. But they forgive England. Remember, England, forgive her. It will make no difference, whatever to my services to my country. Though she slay me, yet will I, if not exactly trust in her, at least take my part in her government. Mm. I am ever at my country's call whether it be the embassy in a leading European capital, uh, a governor generalship in the tropics, or my humble mission here to make little Piffington do its bit. <laughs> I am always ready for the sacrifice. Whilst England remains England, wherever there is a public job to be done, you, have, you will find a high castle sticking to it. <laughs> and now, uh, madam, enough of my uh, tragic personal history. You have called on business. What can I do for you? You have relatives at the Foreign Office, have you not? Madam, the Foreign Office is staffed by my relatives exclusively. Has the Foreign Office warned you that you are being pursued by a female spy who is determined to obtain possession of a certain list of gun emplacements? That is uh, typically well known to this department, madam. Is it? Who told you? Was it one of your German brothers-in-law? I have only three German brothers-in-law, madam. Really, from your tone, one would suppose that I had several. Pardon my sensitiveness on the subject, but reports are continually being circulated that I had been shot as a traitor in the courtyard of the Ritz Hotel simply because I have German brothers-in-law. If you had a German brother-in-law, Madam, you would know that nothing else in the world produces so strong an anti-German feeling. Life affords no keener pleasure than finding a brother-in-law's name in German casualty list. Nobody knows that better than I. Wait until you hear what I have come to tell you. You will understand me as no one else could. Listen, this spy, this woman. Yes? She is a German. Yes, yes, she was. A Hun. Continue. She is my sister-in-law. I see you are well connected, madam. Uh, proceed. Need I add that she is my bitterest enemy? May I? No. Quite so. She is an intimate friend of your brother at the war office. Hungerford High Castle, um, Blue Lou, as you call him, I don't know why. He was originally called uh, the Singing Oyster because he sang drawing room ballads with such an extraordinary absence of expression. And then he was called Blue Point for a season or two. Uh, finally, he became a Blue Lou. Oh, indeed. I didn't know. Well, Blue Lou is simply infatuated with my sister-in-law, and he has rashly let out to her that this list is in your possession. He forgot himself because he was in a towering rage at it being entrusted to you. His language was terrible. He ordered all the guns to be shifted at once. What on earth did he do that for? I can't imagine. But this I know. She made a bet with him that she would come down here and obtain possession of that list and get clean away into the street with it. He took the bet on condition that she brought it straight back to him at the war office. Good heavens! You mean 
mean to tell me that Lulu was such a dolt as to believe that she could succeed? Ha! Only take me for a fool! Impossible! He's jealous of your intellect. The bet is an insult to you. Don't you feel that? After what you have done for our country. Never mind that. It is the idiocy of the thing that I look at. He'll lose his bet and serve him right. You feel sure that you'll be able to resist the siren? I warn you, she's very fascinating. You have no need of fear, madam. I hope she will come and try it on. A fascination is a game that a tool can play at. For centuries, the younger sons of the high castles have had nothing to do but fascinate attractive females. <laughs> Were they not sitting on the royal commissions or on a duty at Knightsbridge barracks? Uh, by gad, madam! If the siren comes here, she will uh, meet her match. I feel that. But if she fails to seduce you... Madam! Hmm, from your allegiance. Oh, that. <laughs> there she will resort to fraud, to force, to anything. She will burgle your office. She will have you attacked and garroted in the night in the street. Oh, I'm not afraid. Oh, your courage will only tempt you into danger. She may get the list after all. Is it true that the gun's removed? <laughs> but she would win her bet. You did not say the guns were moved. You said that Blue Lou had ordered them to be moved. No, it's the same thing, isn't it? Not quite. At the war office. No doubt those guns will be moved, possibly even before the end of the war. <laughs> and you think they're still there? But if the German war office gets the list, and she will copy it before she gives it back to Blue Lou, you may depend on it. All is lost. Well, I should not go so far as that. Will you swear to me, not to repeat what I'm going to say to you? For if the British public knew that I had said it, I should be hounded down as a pro-German. I will be silent as the grave. I swear it. Well, our people have for some reason made up their minds about the German war office that is everything that our war office is not. It carries a promptitude, efficiency, organization to a pitch of completeness and perfection that must be, in my opinion, destructive to the happiness of the staff. <laughs> my own view, which you are pledged, Reverend, not to betray, is that the German War Office is no better than any other war office. I found that opinion on my observation of the characters of my brothers-in-law, one of whom, by the way, is on the German general staff. I... I'm not at all sure that the list of gun emplacements would receive the smallest attention. Uh, you see, there is always so much more important things to be attended to, family matters and so on. You understand. Still, if a question were asked in the House of Commons... The advantage of being at war, uh, madam, is that nobody takes the slightest notice of the House of Commons. <laughs> no doubt it's sometimes necessary for a minister to soothe the more seditious members of that assembly by... I'm giving a pledge or two, but the War Office takes no notice of such things. Then you think this list of the gun placements doesn't matter? By no means, madam. It matters very much indeed. The spy were to obtain possession of the list. Bluely would tell the story at every dinner table in London. And I would say... You might lose your post, of course. I lose my post? <laughs> what are you dreaming about, madam? How could I possibly be spared? There are hardly enough high castles to present, uh, to, to at my present, to fill half the post created by this war. Uh, no, no, Lulu will not go that far. He is at least a gentleman, but I should be chaffed, and frankly, I don't like being chaffed. Oh, of course not. Who does? It would never do. Oh, never, never. And I'm glad you see it in that light. And now, as a measure of security, I shall place, put that list in my pocket, and... Oh, no. The dickens did I say off? It's a deuce. I put it on the... Lucy's last letter, and... Lucy's last letter. Oh, what a title for a picture play. Yes. It is, isn't it? Uh, Lucy appeals to the imagination like no other woman. <laughs> uh, by the way, I wonder if you could...
could read it for me. And Lucy is a darling girl, but I really can't read her writing. In London, I get the office typist to decipher it and make me a typed copy, but here there is nobody. Well, it really is almost illegible. Uh, I think uh, the beginning is uh, meant to be a, a dearest Gus. Yes, that is what she usually calls me. Uh, please go on. Uh, what a what a oh, uh, what a forgetful old something you are. I can't make up the word. Is it blighter? That is one of the favourite expressions of hers. Oh, I think so. Or at all events, it begins with a B. What a forgetful old blighter. Come in! The clerk enters. What is this ridiculous mummery, sir? They've passed me. The recruiting office came in for me. I've had my two and seven. I shall not permit it. What do they mean by taking my office staff? Good God. They will be taking our hunt servants next. What did the man mean? What did he say? He said that now you were on the job, we'd want another million men. And he was going to take the old age person, uh, pensioners or anyone he could get. Did you dare knock at my door to interrupt my business with this lady to repeat this man's ineptitudes? No. I come because the waiter from the hotel brought this paper you left. You left it on the coffee room uh, breakfast table this morning. Ah, yes, it's uh, addressed to you, Lord Augustus. Oh, imprudent. Everybody would guess its importance with your name on it. Unfortunately, I have some letters of my own uh, here. Uh, why not hide them in one of my envelopes? <laughs> that no one would dream of the enclosure being of any importance of political value. Have you any further business here, pray? Am I to give the waiter anything? Or will you do it yourself? Which waiter is it? The English one? No. The one that calls himself a Swiss. Shouldn't wonder if he'd made a copy of that paper. Keep your impertinent surmises to yourself, sir. Remember that you are in the army now, and let me have no more of your civilian insubordination. Attention! Turn left! Quick march! I don't know what you mean. Go to the guards and ask yourself for disobeying orders. Now do you know what I mean? Now look here, I'm not going to argue with you. Or I'm with you! Out with you! Out with you! He seizes the clerk and rushes him through the door. The moment the lady is left alone, she snatches a sheet of official paper from the stationery rack, folds it so it resembles the list, compares the two to see that they look exactly alike whips the list into her wallet and substitutes the facsimile for it. Then she listens for the return of Augustus. A crash is heard, as of the clerk falling downstairs. Augustus returns and is about to close the door when the voice of the clerk is heard from below. I'll have the law off of you for this. I will. There's no more law for you, you scoundrel. You're a soldier now. Thank heaven the war has given us an upper hand of these fellows at last. Excuse my violence, but... Discipline is absolutely necessary in dealing with the lower middle classes. Oh, serve the insolent creature right. Look, I found you an envelope for the list, an unmistakable lady's envelope. Excellent, really. Very clever of you. like to have a peep at the list. Oh, no. Please, no. Well, why? We'll uh, advise you. Uh, no, stop. Remember, if there should be an inquiry, you must be able to swear that you never showed the list to a mortal soul. Oh, that's just a mere form. If you're really curious, I don't... I am not. 
I couldn't bear to look at it. One of my dearest friends was blown to pieces by an aircraft gun, and since then I've never been able to think of one without horror. Hmm. You mean it was a real gun? It actually went off? Hmm. How sad. How sad. And now, Lord Augustus, I've taken up too much of your valuable time. Goodbye. Well, what? Must you go? Oh, you're so busy. Yes, but not before lunch, you know. I can never do much before lunch. Never do much before lunch. But I'm no good at all in the afternoon, and from five to six is my real working time. Must you really go? No, I must, really. I have done my business very satisfactorily. Thank you ever so much. Augustus oh. shakes her hand affectionately as he leads her to the door, but fast pressing the bell button with his left hand. Goodbye. Goodbye. So sorry to lose you. Kind of you to come. But there is no real danger. You see, my dear little lady, all this talking about war, saving and secrecy, and keeping the blinds down at night and so forth is all very well. But unless it's carried out with intense, believe me, you may waste a pound to save a penny, you may let all sorts of secrets out to the enemy, you may guide the zeppelins right down your own chimneys. And as for the ability of the governing class to come in, mm. uh, shall I call a fellow taxi for you? No, thanks. I prefer walking. Goodbye. Again, many, many thanks. She goes out. Augustus returns to the writing table, smiling, and takes another look at himself in the mirror. The clerk returns with his head bandaged. What did you ring for? Don't you come nigh me, or I'll split your head with this poker. Thick as it is. Does not seem an exceptionally fit poker. I rang for you to show the lady out. She's gone. She ran out like a rabbit. I ask myself, why was she here in such a hurry? Lord Augustus! Lord Augustus! She's calling you. <laughs> what calling is it? Window. Uh, why don't you come up? Is the clerk there? Yes. Do you want him? Yes. Lady wants you at the window. Yes, ma'am. Here I am. Ma'am. What's it? What is it? Ma'am. I want you to witness that I got clean away into the street. I'm coming up now. The two men stare at each other. Wants me to witness that she got clean away into the street. What on earth does that mean? The lady returns. Mm -hmm. Yes, I got clean into the street. Miss Holland. What number shall I get you? The war office, please. The war office? If you would be so kind. But, very well. Hello, is it the town recruiting office? Give me Colonel Bogey Sharp. I don't think I'm awake. This is a dream of a movie picture, this is. Shut up, are you? What? To whom do you want to get off? Lulu. Oh, put me through to Lord Hungerford High Castle. Brother, idiot! That you, Brulu? A lady here, little Pifflington, wants to speak to you. Hold the line. Now, madam. Is that Brulu? <laughs> Do you recognize my voice? I've won our bet. Your bet? <laughs> yes. 
I have the list in my wallet. Something of the kind, madam. I have it here in my pocket. Yes, I got clean into the street with it, and I have a witness. I could have got to London with it. Augustus won't deny it. Nothing written on this. Where is the list of guns? <laughs> oh, it was quite easy. I said I was my sister-in-law, and that I was a hun. He lapped it up like a kitten. He means the same. I've got hold of the list for the moment and then changed it for a piece of paper out of the stationery rack. It's quite easy. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shh, shh, No, you don't. <laughs> what? Yes. I'm coming up on the 1, 1.35. Why not have tea with me at Rumpelmeister's? Rum pull my stirs. You know, they call it Robertson's now. Right. Ta ta. Madam, I consider your conduct most unpatriotic. You make bets and abuse the confidence of the hard worked officials who are doing their bit for their country when our gallant fellows are perishing in the trenches. Oh. Oh, the gallant fellows are not all in the trenches, Augustus. Some of them have come home for a few days' hard-earned leave, and I'm sure you won't grudge them a little fun at your expense. Hear, hear! Now, where is the list? For my country's sake! Oh. Thank you so much for joining us for Augustus Does His Bit. Um, we'll be back again uh, next week with another play here on the Shakespeare Underground. If you care to donate to support uh, what we're doing so we can keep going uh, with this project, you can do that at theactorstheater.org. Uh, thanks so much and have a good night. <laughs>